Hello, I am Alex, a senior engineer at the LEGO Group, with a main focus on software architecture and domain-driven design. I've been working my magic at the LEGO Group since the beginning of 2021, but have been focusing on the platform we're going to talk about for the past year and a half or so. In my spare time, I'm passionate about open source, software design, and climbing. Hi, I'm Ulrik. I'm an engineer at the LEGO Group, where I've been since I graduated my master's degree in computer science in 2019. I'm passionate about free open source software, cryptography, security, tinkering with all kinds of things. I love playing with things and making them fit together. Old devices, new devices, analog, digital, complex, simple, anything really. And then I love building with my LEGO bricks. Here at the LEGO Group, we use Apache Pulsar to facilitate asynchronous communication across bounded contexts within the company. It allows IT products to subscribe to events from other IT products operating in different contexts and react to them in real time. Similarly, it allows teams to publish events that they believe could be useful for others to react to. But doing something like this without it becoming the Wild West can be challenging. How we are managing that is what this talk is all about. To elaborate on that, here's Alex who will tell you more. We found that Pulsar gave users way too much control. Anyone could write to any topic and there were no standards for naming them. We needed a way to bring order to the chaos and regain control of our event streaming infrastructure. So our main challenge was the lack of standardization and control. We knew we wanted to enforce standards for naming as well as control permissions so that only authorized users could access certain topics. And we also needed discoverability of those topics to make sure that users could easily find what is there. On top of that, it was extremely important that we maintain self-service control from the user's point of view. So that means our solution must be self-service first, make things discoverable, meaning that they should, there should be a way of finding out which topics are out there and what information they relay and it should create an environment of interoperability and automation. So in order to bring order to the chaos, we decided to use async API, which is a specification or standard designed specifically for event-driven architecture. Async API has a lot of benefits, and amongst those, it clears one of our original concerns, which was lack of standardization. So, Async API enables you to define and document message-driven APIs in a format that is machine-readable, much like the Open API specification. And much like the Open API specification, it allows you to describe the functionality of your API and how consumers can interact with it. So everything from contact details to the event schemas and where to subscribe to them and everything else. So from our point of view, there are a couple of main benefits to using a specification-based approach. Those being standardization, machine readability, and improved documentation. The specification provides a standardized way of defining an API's functionality and behavior, making it easier for different services to communicate with each other. It provides a machine readable format that we can easily parse and can be processed by tools and scripts. And if everyone reads and writes the same documentation format, we can utilize that as a standard for how we document our event-driven APIs at the LEGO Group. This interoperability of having a standardized format is what we can really benefit from, as if we enforce all documentation to be written in this form, we can use it for knowing what topics are there and perhaps even create them. All of which leads to, as mentioned, increased interoperability reduced integration costs, and a much more efficient development and testing lifecycle. Briefly diving into Async API, it describes many things, but at its core lies channels. So on Async API, topics or queues or whatever you call them are abstracted as just channels. A very basic topic in an Async API specification could look something like this example. A single channel called User Signed Up, which is a subscribe channel, meaning that consumers should pull from that channel. Now that everyone writes async API specifications to document their asynchronous APIs, this leads us to the main event, so to speak, which is what we've built in between the specifications and Pulsar. 
Having briefly gone into async API, let's look into how we actually use it. So what we built is a platform that takes async API specifications and uses them to configure Pulsar so that it lives up to that specification. We call this AMA. So now that we have that, it means that we can enforce standards for naming topics and namespaces, as well as control permissions so that only authorized users can access certain topics. Addition, the platform is fairly simple in that someone uploads a specification and we configure Pulsar all while storing the specifications for later, which was our second goal of discoverability. The steps for making this work looks something like the image in the slide. An API owner uploads a specification either through a CI CD flow or manually to our platform, whatever works for them. AMA reads the specification and configures topics in Pulsar, and the API can now push messages to those topics. Furthermore, the specification is made available in the developer portal for user consumption, so they can read the documentation. Now, AMA configures a few other things than simply the topic. It also configures permissions for that topic. Between the API, which in this instance is a user service, and Pulsar. In our case, we use OpenID Connect to ensure identity and permissions. We made this work by simply giving the API inside of AMA an identity and then some self-service magic to roll secrets. This in turn fixes our third concern, which was permission management. Expanding on the current picture, we produce events, but what about consumers wanting to, well, consume? Given that we give all APIs an identity, we could easily make this work as well. Diving a bit into the permissions, giving our diverse usage of topics from new Lego sets all the way to integration events and sending email and everything else, we knew from the start that we really wanted to nail down the permissions. In our, in our setup, we have something called connections, which essentially is one API wanting to use the topic of another API. So let's take a look at the flow for that. We needed a way for consumers to gain permissions for the topics in a self-service fashion, of course. Building on the idea of identities with OpenID Connect, we quickly managed to build out a sort of approval flow where you can ask for permissions to topics, letting the owners decide whether they want to allow or deny this quote unquote connection. Following the flow again, a different API would create a client and ask for permissions to use that topic. AMA lets the owners of that topic know that someone wants to consume from it and allows them to simply approve or deny it. If approved, we configure permissions between the topic and the client, and they can now consume messages from that topic. With all that in place, we were in a good space, allowing full self-service control without hindering development, but rather improving it through automation. However, something was still missing. How do we configure certain Pulsar settings as this isn't something that the specification specifies, like persistence and compaction or even retention configuration? Luckily, async API has something called extensions, which is basically a property x dash some key and a value. And as these are first class citizens of the async API specification, it seemed like a good solution why we ended up using them, expressing these different Pulsar configurations. And this worked, but it wasn't as neat as we'd like. We wanted more and preferably something official. We'd like to avoid custom or proprietary extensions as much as possible, and instead leverage and contribute to open standardized tooling when we can. Async API has something called bindings, which are somewhat protocol or technology specific hooks or models in the specification standard, namely for denoting things that are inherently specific to the tech underneath. And these already exist for other brokers, so why not for Pulsar? And can we ourselves do something to fix it? We contributed the official Pulsar bindings in the upstream async API project, which allowed us to dump the majority of our custom extensions. This means that you can now express the intentions of your topics and servers through these bindings in a more natural way. Where we before had X something for each thing we wanted to describe, we now have a standardized way of describing Pulsar specific configuration. In async API, you can have multiple bindings per channel, for instance, which means that you could have a topic that exists both in Pulsar and SNS and still denote these technology differences. So you've heard Alex mention that we create infrastructure in Pulsar from these async API specifications. But how do we actually do it? 
That's what I'm here to tell you more about. We base communication between Pulsar and IMAP on item potent jobs. These jobs, called the Pulsar Admin REST API, however, these API calls are not necessarily item potent by themselves. Therefore, the jobs encapsulate them in additional logic to make sure that the job as a whole is item potent. This allows us to do graceful retries of jobs. It allows us to use the same job for creating the initial infrastructure when the specification is uploaded for the first time and for updating the same infrastructure later when the specification is updated. It allows us to behave in an entirely event-driven, eventually consistent manner. And it allows for easily recreating infrastructure on other clusters, such as if we want to do a multi-master async replication setup. You can see on the slide, I included an example. This is the delete topology. It runs every time a specification has been updated and a channel has been removed. And it runs every time a specification has been deleted and we need to remove all its topics. You can see in the constructor, we start by passing in a copy of the Pulsar REST client. This is to facilitate communication with the Pulsar admin REST API. In the job itself, you can see we pass the workspace name, we pass the scope name, which is the topic name, and we pass a cancellation token. In the job, we try calling the Pulsar admin REST API's endpoint for deleting topics, and then we catch an exception in case the topic doesn't exist. This could either mean that the topic was never created in the first place. It could also mean that this job already ran. You heard me mention earlier that we pass in a copy of the Pulsar REST client. This is an internal c package that we created to make interacting with the Pulsar admin REST API a bit easier. It allows us to call the API endpoints as ordinary asynchronous functions, abstracting away all the details of HTTP calls, and allowing us just to focus on the logic of what we want to do with the API in our jobs. This makes it much easier to interact with the API and allows us to pass c -sharp types directly. In this example, I've brought two endpoints, one for updating the retention policy of a topic and one for updating the compaction threshold of a topic. The compaction threshold, you can see we pass all the parameters as strings, the namespace name, the topic name, and the compaction threshold itself. For the retention policy, we still pass the namespace and the topic names as strings, but for the compaction policy, we pass a custom c -sharp class that serializes to JSON in the correct format whenever the call is made. For both calls, the tenants are implicit and are set when the client is instantiated. When we want to map properties from our async API specifications to Pulsar infrastructure, it necessitates some trade-offs since the abstractions are different. Let's see what those are. One of the challenges is that in Pulsar we have limited levels of namespacing. We only have tenant, namespace, and topic to work with. Tenants we use to designate the environment, is it production, is it integration, is it development, is it QA, is it whatever. The namespaces we map directly to MI workspaces. And here comes the issue. In AMAP, we support multiple APIs in every workspace, but we only have one level left of the topic names to work with in Pulsar. Therefore, in AMAP, we need to make sure that none of the names of channels in the various specifications in the same workspace collide, because then the topic names will also collide with the program. Another thing is that there's limited integration with OAuth for role based access control. We currently use OAuth in order to do authentication for all clients with an external OAuth provider. However, all our authorization is still done internally in the Pulsar cluster itself. It could probably be done with a custom plugin we could write, but uh, we haven't gotten to that yet. Another thing could be that we would like more granularity for authorization. An example is that we would like to be able to forbid ordinary clients from unsubscribing to topics since this will delete the subscription. Under our model, all subscriptions should be created and deleted through AMA. Because we can't stop this right now, our users can enter a state where they've deleted their subscription by accident, but they're not able to create a new one and need to go back and do it through AMA. Fixing this would be awesome. 
but it's not all bad. Pulsa has some nifty features that help us a lot with this, all these things as well. Properties and topics are really great for storing additional metadata that we can just look up on the topic whenever we need it. And topic level policies are the base of everything we do. However, it's not all bad. Properties and topics are amazing for storing additional metadata. And topic level policies, even though they are all by default in Pulsa, are invaluable to everything we do. The reason for this is that topic level policies have the same granularity as our permissions on our specifications, allowing us to set custom attention policies, compaction policies, time to live, and all those things on the various topics, instead of just doing it on a namespace level and enforcing the same level on all APIs in the same um, web service. But I've been keeping you waiting long enough. How do we actually map things? You heard me mention earlier that we map AMA workspaces directly to Pulsar namespaces. We then take the title of the async API specification and put in a property on every topic that's created from that specification. Channels we map one to one to topics and create one for each. And then we use the subscribe and publish properties to set the correct permissions on the program. If it's a subscribe channel, then we set produce permissions for the owner. If it's a published channel, then we set consume permissions for the owner and add a subscription for them. We use bindings and specifications extensions to set a time to live, retention, compaction, deduplication, and in the future, which clusters to replicate this topic between as well. And to conclude, we'd like to thank you for listening in. We're sure you've been a great audience and we hope you feel inspired from hearing about our approach and that you'll use that inspiration to build amazing things. Take care and keep playing.